This is a distinguished uh, lecture series. I don't know how distinguished I am, but I'll tell you, the more trips you make to that bar, the better this is going to be. <laughs> you know, I was talking with Alan and Karen and Brian as they were planning on putting together the Area 51 exhibit downstairs. Hope you've all seen it by now. It's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, as they were going through, we were going through my boxes of old stuff, and I'm telling them stories or asking questions about how I got de started down this path, I would tell him what it was like back in those days and how I got hooked on the story and uh, how I met Bob Lazar. And, and they seemed fascinated with those behind the scenes stories of, of how those things went down back in those days, why I would essentially um, put my career and my credibility at risk, chase something seemingly so crazy and ridiculous, uh, how I could still be looking at this subject so many years later. And so I shared with them some of the backstory and the details on how I became interested, what was going on behind the scenes, the price that everyone associated with this has paid over the years, and how my views on some of the larger issues involved have evolved over the years. And they seemed to think some of those stories were interesting, so they asked me to share them with you uh, tonight in some sort of a public forum. And, you know, and I, while I have spoken many times in public about Area 51 and about Bob Lazar and some of the crazy stuff that's happened, uh, the general topic of UFOs, at least some of these tales here tonight uh, have not been told in any detail at all, and I'm going to reveal the existence of a witness who was whispering in my ear back then. We call this in the news business burying the lead, but somewhere along the line here tonight, I'm going to tell you the name of a guy who was, uh, who was interested in this topic and who helped me along the way, and uh, I think it could qualify maybe as a headline somewhere. Um, I will say at the outset that, uh, that although you know, I will never be allowed to set foot on that base. I'll never get any closer to it than the warning signs that say use of deadly force is authorized. And I've been out there maybe a hundred times over the years, you know, dodging around in the desert and trying to keep from, from being intercepted by the camo dudes and, and dodging uh, dirt clods and dust devils and, and uh, all kinds of things like that and coyotes. Um, I'll never get any closer to it than the signs at which, of course, the signs are many miles from most of the interesting stuff that goes on out there. Still, uh, Area 51 is, uh, to me, is as much a part of my life as it is for the people who worked out there. I mean, it's been 24 years. Uh, the people who worked out there, uh, people like my friend T.D. Barnes, who's here in the audience tonight, uh, the Roadrunners, uh, they toiled in obscurity, couldn't even tell their, their spouses what they were doing for a living. Uh, they basically protected all of us and we didn't know about it. Not even their own families could know about it. They basically won the Cold War out there. I mean, they were really there. So for them, it's a real part of their life. But I'm telling you, it's as much a part of my life, and it has been for 24 years now, as it is for theirs. I suspect that, you know, years from now when I die, there'll be something about UFOs in Area 51 on a tombstone, assuming that I ever uh, am buried somewhere, they find the body. Uh, <laughs> Area 51, I would say, is as much uh, linked to my name as, is, as if it's like tattooed on my butt. Uh, for better or worse, I guess you could say, those stories we told long ago, back in 1989, um, to begin with, those stories have, I think, paved the way for the rest of the people who really did work out there and toiled in obscurity, as I mentioned, who did all that work to protect all of us, who worked for the CIA and the military, for them to come forward and tell their story. And back when we started uh, talking about flying saucers, you'll recall the government did not acknowledge that the base even existed. Uh, there was a time back when they first set up the facility that the government put out a little, uh, little notice that sent to Channel 8 and other media people says, we're going to build this little facility out here in the desert at a place called Watertown. Don't worry, it's a temporary thing, it'll go away, and don't pay any attention to it kind of a thing. And, and that's what they acknowledged. And then some years later, 
you know, you can look at a map of the Nevada test site and there's Area 15, there's Area 12, and there's this box over here outside the test site itself, but it was called Area 51 and it was on the maps. And then all of a sudden it disappeared. You know, it went away. And in the years when I first started working on the story, the government would not acknowledge that it existed. Now I've got Russian satellite photos that I obtained. I can see pictures of it. I had a guy named John Lear who walked right up to the gate in years past who showed me close-up photos of it. I talked to people who worked out there. You could climb up a hill and look at the damn thing, and yet our government would say it didn't exist. Well, naturally, that kind of a situation is going to get you curious about, about a place like that. Back in those days, though, outside of Nevada, other than people who had worked there or were in the military, few people anywhere had heard of the place. You didn't know the name Area 51. Uh, it was spoken about in whispers. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, the fact that the CIA guys who worked out there, the fact that military people who worked out there who have reasons to be proud of the work that they did have been allowed in the last couple of years to come forward and talk about it, I think a lot of that has to do with these crazy flying saucer stories that we told. Because it sort of blew the lid off the idea that there really isn't a base out there, acknowledged that there really is legitimate national security programs going on, and sort of paved the way and made it acceptable for them to come forward and talk about the great work that they did. As I said, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that there was a time not that long ago when, when the base really didn't exist and so few people knew about it, or those who did know about it had to use a nickname or a code name for the place. Um, now, however, it is known in every corner of the world. It's known everywhere. In fact, I'm going to show you a little clip here in a second. Um, and it wouldn't have happened without these stories that we did about Bob Lazar and Area 51. I, I think that, um, you know, I've been a journalist, as Alan mentioned in the introduction, at Channel 8 since 1981. And I've covered just about every kind of story you can imagine. Uh, organized crime, drug dealers, gun runners, corrupt officials, scams, rip-offs, campaign hijack, hijinks, sex scandals, political convention, buried treasure, polluters, murders, fires, bikers, stick-ups, pot farmers, crack peddlers, scumbags, boneheads, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. <laughs> and yet, wherever I go, whoever I talk to, I'm the UFO reporter. Uh, doesn't matter what those other stories, some of them were pretty good stories. Some of them made a difference in the lives of the people who are here in this room. Doesn't matter about those other stories. The thing that people want to talk to me about is UFOs. I don't care if I'm in a grocery store or a restaurant having a meal and they come up and sit, take up a seat uh, in the men's room in front of the urinal, um, sitting in traffic, people yelling out the, out the, wind, the car window to talk to me about UFOs. And, and most of the time it's to ask me, hey, what do, you, what do you think about UFOs? You really believe that stuff? The reality of it is they don't want to ask me what my opinion is. They want to tell me their story because so many people have stories. And I'll bet there are people in here, most people here, if you don't have a story of your own or a sighting or an incident, you know somebody in your family who does because that's how ubiquitous this phenomena is. And it certainly is ubiquitous in my life. I mean, I will be forever branded. I mean, now hardly a day goes by when I don't get a phone call or an email from Ecuador or Iceland or um, uh, Australia or China or somewhere else that somebody has just seen one of my bootleg reports or something on the internet who want to talk to me about UFOs. Uh, 1989, the year that we did the Lazar stories, is the year that I officially went crazy, though, off my rocker, out to lunch. That's, uh, that's when we broke the story about Bob Lazar, the ridiculous notion that there could be recovered alien craft out at Area 51. I know how ridiculous it sounds now. I know how ridiculous it sounded then. Uh, but I'm here to tell you tonight about the circumstances of why we decided to pursue it as a story. Because as a result of that, as I mentioned, that's when the world beat a path to Area 51's door. And uh, it has created a, a legend, a legend was born, a mythology, an ever-evolving mythology, one that has at times been co-opted by people for various reasons, uh, exploited, uh, for their own reasons, by these hopelessly gullible saucer nuts, by uh, people who uh, think that the, the milk carton children are all kidnapped and taken out there to be mixed up in a giant human alien vats to make body parts, uh, you name it. 
uh, people have assigned different stories to it. There was a guy, after I first did these stories about Lazar, who had taken people on tours, charging them 99 bucks a head, and telling them that aliens from the planet Krondak were in charge of the base down there at like the 35 levels below uh, the surface of the Earth. So, story has changed. Uh, it has evolved. Uh, but there's no doubt that as a result of those tales that began with Bob Lazar, it's known all over the world. It began with uh, an interview with Bob Lazar that, uh, that was in silhouette. You saw a piece of that. That was in May of 1989. And then we sort of started working on it. And it just took off from there. And it drove my journalism colleagues crazy. Um, they hated it. And, and I've sort of uh, paid the price for that. I don't mind. I mean, radio DJs back in those days, whenever they would run out of belch, barf, and fart jokes in the morning, uh, would tee off on me. I remember I'm writing a song about the boob on the tube to the tune of The Fool on the Hill. That was pretty funny stuff. Um, my friends at the Review Journal, my friends and colleagues over there, have really had fun at my expense over the years. This is one of a couple of columns that John L. Smith has written uh, about the UFO reporter having a close encounter with skepticism, and he ends it with, besides, I think I saw Elvis milling around in the lobby. Ha, 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 because nobody ever has associated UFOs with Elvis before. This is a column written by their media columnist, Ken White, who said, Get the Nets is the title of the article. It says, Las Vegans are rushing home from work these days in sheer fits of excitement over George Knapp's series on UFOs. Not that they're excited over the reports themselves. They want to be there if George does the big crack up on screen. Will he go... <laughs> Will he go bull goose loony right there in front of thousands, his eyes suddenly going buggy and rolling free in their sockets, his tongue wagging side to side? <laughs> Funny stuff. Um, this is an editorial cartoon. I have it in, at home, by the way, on my wall, uh, the original. It's called The Marshmallow Head Chronicles, Extraterrestrial Hitmen Who Have Come to Earth looking for me, and they're looking at a couple of gasoline pumps. And the line says, of course they are men. That's obvious, but which one is George Knapp? Maybe. <laughs> and then this is one. I did a series about allegations about alien abductions and the certain medical procedures and probes that happen, uh, according to the people who go through this. And the RJ wrote this. They were kidnapped by aliens. <laughs> oh, it, it gets better. They dubbed me a grand mullah in the church of stratospheric proctology. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was a damn fine line. It might be the best thing the RJ has ever written. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, it comes with the territory. I have a public job. I understand that. I'm in a public position. I do a story like that. You're going to catch some grief. I understand that. I have thick skin and I can deal with it. Uh, what sort of bothered me over all the years, though, is how few of these kind of reporters who live here and who could cover the story and go out there, interview the witnesses, go track it down, never did. Uh, it's easier to bang out some wisecracks, do an Elvis joke, maybe pull in Loch Ness Monster and make fun of this stuff than to go talk to somebody like a T.D. Barnes or uh, Bob Lazar or back in those days he was much more accessible or some of the other folks who worked at the base, or to sit out there in the desert night after night as we did and see whatever it is that might be flying around. But they didn't. Uh, they preferred just to take pot shots at it, and that's easier to do, I guess, than to um, do the actual work. And I think the assumption for people for a long time, both regarding Area 51 and more importantly for the larger UFO story, is that anybody who's seriously inter interested in this stuff is nuts, is crazy, is, is bull goose loony. And um, I'll have to tell you that in, uh, in about 90% of the cases, that, that assumption is right, because people who are in this field are crazy. Um, I will just share with you a couple of the experiences that I have had that caused me a great concern in the early days when I was chasing this stuff. There was a woman who showed up at the TV station after the first series of reports. She's wearing the skimpy halter top and holding a kid that I later learned soon learned, was a, an alien hybrid, she told me. And within five minutes of me meeting her, uh, she had to tell me this story, had to meet me, had to talk to me. She's telling me the story. Within five minutes of me meeting her, I knew the most intimate details of her sex life because she said it was while performing a certain sex act outdoors on her porch that she heard a noise and looked up and saw her first UFO. And that eventually, and I'm not making up one word of this, 
Eventually, these, these beings beamed her up on board on their ship, and they told her to, in their, to put on a bathing suit, and they told her in their opinion that she needed breast implants. And uh, I'm not making this up. She's telling me all this stuff, and I go, uh-huh, yeah, I'm writing this stuff down. Oh, really? Yeah. And she says she got them. And I'll tell you, that's the one part of the story I could believe because, because there was ample physical evidence staring me in the face. Um, I received uh, letters from this lady. She was 75 years old at the time, and she lived on a ranch outside Sacramento, California, and she would tell me that every time her husband would leave the ranch, these aliens would come and have their way with her. And she drew me pictures of alien genitalia and, uh, and with little diagrams pointing, and little arrows pointing to it. It wasn't very impressive. I'll, I'll just put it that way. Um, I have been pestered by a millionaire transsexual alien abductee, uh, a guy who says he's the twin brother of Jesus Christ and that aliens are coming back uh, and, uh, to get him, and boy, they're really mad. I had a guy fly to see me. It was, this is a sad story. He flew to see me from Australia, um, used what he said were his last dollars to come to see me because he said he, was, he wanted me to use my contacts at Area 51. That's a laugh. <laughs> Um, to, to talk to the aliens to stop coming and getting him because they come every night to, to, to grab him. He, he, was, he was troubled. He was disturbed. And, and I've had a, a heck of a lot of people like that uh, who've come forward with those kind of stories. I've had people claiming to be aliens waiting for me outside the station who've followed me home. Uh, I've had people send me songs that aliens have written and poems. Uh, I've had people who accuse me of being an alien of being a government agent and a government plant, a government operative. Um, reluctantly, uh, you know, I've appeared on a couple of TV shows that I wish I could take back, the Jesse Ventura show to be one. And, and as a result of that, I've met all kinds of people. I've been to UFO conferences all over the place. Uh, I remember meeting Onek, the 400-year-old Venusian woman. Uh, and because, I guess, the UFO topic is weird, anything weird, that's mine. Come and get it. Uh, you're uh, PS, uh, possessed by Beelzebub, call me up, I can probably do an exorcism. You, you had an out-of-body experience, can't be, get back in, call George up, he'll know what to do with it. <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, I mean, uh, why would I stick with this stuff? How did it ever get this way? And I'll tell you, uh, my connection to the Area 51 story basically started the day I was hired at, at Channel 8 back in 1981. The guy who hired me was named Bob Stodall. He's a good friend of mine. He was the news director, became a mentor to me. And he had, at the time, been collecting little bits and pieces about Area 51, anything that would appear in an aviation magazine. Sometimes there would be a message, uh, a little story about Groom Lake in the newspaper, and he had that file and he showed it to me. I thought, that, mm, that's kind of interesting. And then I didn't think about it for a couple of more years. In 1984, the Air Force illegally seized 89,000 acres around Area 51. They just took it. That's one day it's public land, the next day you try to drive on that land and there's guys with guns there and you're turned back. And they later, two years later, asked for permission to do it. And I've got a little clip I'll show you in a minute, a couple of minutes about them appearing to, uh, before Congress to talk about it in which they're asked, well, what authority did you do this under? Well, we'll have to tell you in a closed door briefing. And uh, so that caught my attention. I did, wrote some stories about that back then, but I didn't do anything again for a while. However, my friend, Mr. Stodall, and his friend, Ned Day, who became a mentor to me, were very busy with a story of their own. They broke the story about the existence of the stealth fighter being tested and test flown out there at Air 51. Um, and that was a big story. F-117A, they broke it, everybody else picked it up. As a result of that story going public, Ned Day was picked up by the FBI. They picked him up off a street corner, put him in a room, it was just like a scene out of a movie with a real hot light in his face saying, how dare you endanger the lives of 220 million Americans by letting this story out? Don't you know the Russians can find this out? And Ned was pretty scared for a while until he remembered a, a lesson from journalism school and he said, look man, I'm just a little reporter in Las Vegas. If I can find this out, don't you think that the Russians can find it out too? And so they let him go. 
But that was a big story. And the reason we were allowed to, we were able to get it is because of a guy named John Lear. And uh, John Lear is a, is a friend of mine. Uh, I, now, I, I met him in, first in 87, I think. He showed up at the TV station. He had been the source to alert Ned and them to the existence of this, this um, plane out there at Area 51. So he had a certain amount of credibility at Channel 8. And he had also, he had run for the state senate. Uh, his family, of course, is well known in Nevada. The Learjet had developed that. John had uh, been a uh, pilot for the CIA. He had flown just about every plane you can imagine. Very accomplished guy and in a lot of ways uh, 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 distinguished and smart and in, in the view of a lot of people completely crazy uh, because he became interested in UFOs and I mean when he became interested he went all the way so he shows up at the station one day not long after helping Ned to break that story about Area 50 or the uh, F-117 and he's got a great big stack of UFO documents and he drops them on Ned's desk and he says you gotta read this stuff this is really interesting it's the biggest story in history and um, what do you think? And Ned says, I'm not having any part of this. People will think I'm crazy. I don't have time to deal with UFOs, forget it. Well, I'm eavesdropping at the time, and uh, so I, as, as usual, and so I said, hey, let me take a look at that stuff. And I so first met John Lear, and I took that stuff home and started reading it. Some of it was obviously uh, manufactured by someone, but a lot of it was legitimate documents obtained from our government secret studies conducted by military uh, agencies and, and authorities about the UFO issue in which these matters were taken very seriously. I thought, huh, that's, that's pretty interesting. I had never at, at the time given any kind of thought to UFOs. I had had some discussions within my own family about things that had happened long ago, but as far as I know, I had never seen one. Uh, I, had, I had one UFO book that somebody had given me as, as a gift, something I read and put aside no abiding interest at all. It certainly was not a religion for me or any cause in my life, uh, but I looked at it and I thought, I'm gonna put John Lear on this little show I have called On the Record. It was a, one of those 30 minute talk shows, political discussions, you'd have a city councilman on or something to talk about things that nobody cared about. It aired at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and nobody watched it. Uh, but I put Lear on, he started doing this UFO manifesto, aliens, abductions, all this stuff. And I just kind of sat there with my, my jaw agog and, and listened to it. And then the, phone, the, the, the program ended, it aired, and the phone started ringing. And it's people wanting to tell me stories about UFOs. I thought, well, this is pretty interesting. Um, it had obviously touched the pulse of the public in a way that I did not understand and did not appreciate. I had Lear on again. And the response was even bigger. And in that second appearance, he hinted that he knew somebody who might be getting hired at Area 51. That person turned out to be Bob Lazar. And then I had him on a third time with another crazy guy named uh, Bill Cooper, um, uh, who really went off the deep end. And the response was even bigger. And I realized, you know what? I'm going to have to look into this stuff. Uh, I'm going to have to start taking this seriously and read on it, read about it. So I started sort of my own little learning curve. And the learning curve, as you probably know, if you're into the topic, is considerable. Um, then came the day, the next significant event was in May of 1989. I was co-anchoring our five o'clock news. We had a little um, interview segment we did every day. Entertainers, politicians, whoever was interesting in town. We just wanted it to be a kind of a fun interview. And at the last minute, our interview canceled. So I called up Lear and I said, hey, do you think that UFO guy you were hinting about um, would he come on? I, I'll, I'll even black out his face if he have to. And sure enough, he did. And we put Bob Lazar on and did like a five minute interview and, uh, in which he told this story, this crazy story, about working at a place called S4, Papoose Lake, south of Groom Lake, within the Area 51 complex, nine flying saucers out there in, in uh, hangars built in to be disguised like the side of a mountain, uh, alien in origin, they all look different as if we got the variety pack. <laughs> and holy cow, what to believe about this? But again, the response from the audience was absolutely overwhelming. So when it finished, I went and talked to the news director and we said, uh, well, let's figure out what to do here because if this guy's telling the truth, obviously this is a pretty damn big story. And, um, and as crazy as it might sound, let's do some work and find out if there's anything to it and we'll do some reporting on it. So. About a week later, we went to Lear's house to meet with Bob. Uh, Lear was playing games with us then and wouldn't even, still wouldn't tell us his, Lazar's real name. 
Uh, what he didn't know is that Lazar had signed the guest book at the entrance to, the Bob, to John's house, so when I walked in, I saw the name there and I figured out what it was. Um, we talked to Bob Lazar, we put him through paces, Stodall and I, asking him questions about his background, and he seemed like a humble, intelligent, sincere guy. We left the meeting and said, you know what, um, let's give this a go here. We, we recognize there are risks to our credi professional credibility and standing. We decided we would be careful, maybe do a couple of parts, a couple of minutes a night, uh, that instead of a couple of parts uh, over a couple of nights, it became 10 minutes a night over two weeks. And it was the highest rated series we ever aired. But that didn't happen until November. And in between May and November, I did this intense crash course in UFOs in which I tried to learn everything I could, not only about UFOs in general, what the government might or might not know, but about Lazar. And um, as I said, it was a, it's a huge learning curve. 90, 95% of everything in the field, I figure, is complete nonsense. It's made up, it's conspiracy stuff, it's lunatic theories, it's crap put out by people who either want attention or they're nuts or they want to sell something. But there's this kernel of truth in the middle of all that, of proof. And you have to wade through a lot of chaff to get to the wheat, but it's there. And I think that any reasonable person who does the work and wades through it all to find the kernel of truth inside would believe likewise. That is, unless, as it is for some, a religion. Just as you have people on one side who believe everything they hear, everything in the sky is a flying saucer, you have other people on the other side, the skeptics, they call themselves, but really they're debunkers. And it wouldn't matter if a saucer landed on the White House lawn, they wouldn't believe it. And you couldn't convince them because it would upset their worldview. It's a religion for them, as strongly as it's a religion for the people on the other side and no amount of evidence would change their minds. That's at least what I came to believe. Um, and for me, I guess, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in general about the concept of proof, because what is proof? It's, it's what should be able to convince a reasonable person that something is true. I happen to think that in the area of UFOs, there's more than enough. And what I learned in the course of those next few months and have learned in the 24 years since is that there's a heck of a lot of proof if people are willing to look at it. The first one being in the area of eyewitness testimony. Now I know that eyewitness testimony can be inherently unreliable, but you got people, 30, 40 million Americans who will admit seeing UFOs, probably as many who won't admit it, but have seen them. And it's true that 90% or more of all UFO sightings can be explained away as prosaic um, objects, misidentifications of balloons and planes and things like that. But it's also true that nine out of 10 UFOs are not reported at all because there's no one who will take the reports, not except for civil, civilian organizations. You call McCarran or Nellis today and tell them you've seen a UFO, they'll keep you on the phone, or the police, they'll keep you on the phone long enough to find out if you're dangerous to somebody, but they don't care about a UFO, or at least they won't admit it. Oh, our interest in that stuff stop. So people like you and me, somebody who sees something strange in the sky, there's nowhere to report it, but millions of people have reported it. Millions of people all over the world have seen these things dating back thousands of years in every culture, on every continent, in every civilization in human history have seen them. Uh, they had different names for them and they have different descriptions, but they've seen them. Um, that counts for something. That, that counts for something. Second type of proof is photographic evidence. Today, with what is done online uh, with, uh, with computer software, it's hard to believe anything you see anymore. Uh, but in the years before we all had computers uh, with this kind of power in our homes, there are photos and videos that are reliable that have been tested, even by the military, that show anomalous objects, anomalous solid objects, solid craft that perform maneuvers that our best technology can't do. Not even the stuff at Area 51. The third kind of proof is physical evidence. Now, I get this all the time. Well, well, you know, why don't we have a cigarette lighter from a UFO or something like that? Where's the Roswell uh, crash stuff? If I knew, I'd tell you. But we don't have that. However, there is physical evidence. Scientists will say, there's nothing to analyze with UFOs. They're here one minute and they're gone the next. That is not true. 
Um, all over the world, as witnesses have reported these things happening, there are what we call landing site trace cases. Witnesses say, this UFO landed in my backyard. Ah, come on, get out of here. But if you go out in the backyard and you look, you find a number of physical types of evidence. Burned or baked soil, um, impressions, imprints on the ground, um, trees that are affected by things that fly up and down. Animals have been affected, people have been affected, burned, things of that sort. It is physical evidence for anybody who has the uh, guts to go ahead and look at it. Now, J. Allen Hynek, I remember him saying, uh, arguing with some scientists, there's no physical evidence. He says, you know what? Airplanes fly over the Australian outback every single day and don't crash. And uh, people look up and see them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't exist, but that they, the fact that they don't have a, the Aborigines down below don't have a piece of one. The fourth type of proof that I want to talk about very briefly is government documents. I hinted about this before. It's what got me hooked. I told you that John Lear had uh, helped me in the beginning with those great big stack of documents. Well, he continued to give me piles of documents, things that had been squeezed out of our government. The most impressive evidence of all, I think, are these reports and studies written by our government, by our military, about UFOs long before the Freedom of Information Act existed. These reports were written for military people only to see, evaluations for the president, for the CIA, for the Joint Chiefs, and we were never supposed to know about it. Now, you ask about that kind of stuff before the FOIA existed, and these agencies denied that they had anything. In fact, the, the FBI was asked a bunch of times, what do you got on UFOs? We don't have anything, nothing. FOIA is passed in the mid-70s. The FBI was forced to release 2,000 pages of documents about UFOs. Um, same thing with the CIA. I've written to them a bunch of times when I first started. Hey, what do you got on UFOs? Nothing. We never studied it, never had any interest. Well, bull. I mean, there are documents that were squeezed out of them through FOIA, and in in, even in the 70s, what that referred to the CIA's UFO experts, CIA UFO panels, CIA UFO studies. That one study that they had in particular I want to mention is something called the Robertson Panel. This is in the 1950s. They convened this panel. They'd had a whole bunch of UFO sightings, this great big flap. What are we going to do about this stuff? Well, let's look at the evidence. They gathered evidence from about eight or nine, ten cases and looked at it for a grand total of six hours over two days. And they said, you know what? We don't think that UFOs are a threat to national security, but the reporting of UFOs is a potential threat to national security. So we need to institute some changes. We need to strip UFOs of their aura of mystery, strip them of their respectability, make it lack less than respectable to report them. So they instituted formally a ridicule factor, a laughter curtain, a policy of making fun of people that see this stuff, belittling the whole subject, embarrassing scientists who take it seriously, and it's worked. It's worked. Now those documents exist. I'll, I'll show you some other ones. Um, I gave a pile of stuff to the museum here. I'm not sure if it's on display or not. This is a report uh, compiled by the U.S. Air Force and the Office of Naval Intelligence in 1948, December 1948. And uh, it was, there was something called Project Sign uh, that was a secret study of UFOs. And the, the guys came back, they looked at all these cases, they said, this stuff's real. We think it's entirely possible that these things are from other planets. A uh, Hoyt Vandenberg, who was the head of the uh, Air Force, I think, back then, said, I can't allow that to go forward. Forget it. Burn that copy and come up with something new. So Project Sign became Project Grudge, and they came up with a much different conclusion. But later, uh, Project Blue Book, which was nothing more than a, a public relations exercise, collected 19,000 or so cases. And even though they tried to explain them away, they couldn't. Now, in this document, one copy continued to exist, even though it was supposed to be destroyed. It says, it must be accepted that some type of flying objects have been observed. Their identification and origin are not discernible. Since the Air Force is responsible for control of the air and the defense of the U.S., it's imperative that all agencies cooperate in confirming or denying the possibility that these objects have a domestic origin. I'll tell you about something else. It's not really a document. This is a chapter from an Air Force physics textbook. And uh, our best and brightest pilots, our future Joint Chiefs of Staff members, go to the Air Force Academy for training and education. And this chapter, it's called a P Introductory Space Science, Department of Physics, U.S. Air Force Academy, was what they taught the cadets at the Air Force Academy. Let me quote you from it. Conclusion, 
From available information, the UFO phenomenon appears to have been global in nature for almost 50,000 years. The majority of known witnesses have been reliable people who've seen easily explained natural phenomena, and there appears to be no overall positive correlation with population density. Psychological factors probably do not enter the data picture as noise. Um, it, it goes on to say that in the course of your career as a pilot, you're probably going to encounter one of these things. As far as we can tell, there may be four different races visiting the planet, and it's been going on for thousands of years. This is what they're teaching their best and brightest pilots. Now, after UFO people got a hold of this chapter and pointed it out, hey, you guys been lying to us, they pulled it, they yanked it, um, which has sort of been the reaction all the way along. And I don't really completely understand it, but that's what they did. So I think, you know, when you look at the, the trail, the paper trail of government documents, it's more than persuasive. The kinds of stuff that is squeezed out of the, our government, report after report, incident after incident, more than enough evidence to convince a reasonable person that something really weird has been flying around in these skies. And I'll tell you, it's not only documents from this country. As a result of me being interested in this crazy subject, I've been allowed to travel all over the world. Um, and one of the trips, two of the trips, took me to Russia. We had a window of opportunity in the 1990s in which uh, we went to Russia. Uh, this company I work for, I left Channel 8 for a couple of years, uh, hired this Russian physicist. We met him through Congressman Bill Bray, uh, who was a friend of ours. And he was, the physicist had worked at the highest levels of the Russian government. He's a science national, national security advisor to Boris Yeltsin, also to the Russian parliament. He had trained Soviet cosmonauts how to spot American nuclear submarines from space. The guy was dialed in. So I met him as he was getting ready to go back to, to Russia, and I asked him, you know anything about UFOs? You got any friends in the KGB? Have you ever heard anything about it? Ah, eh, not really. Not that I could think about it. We had another beer. You know, now that you mentioned it, I do have a friend at the KGB who told me that he had heard about, read some UFO studies, that they had documents over there. And then he thought, there's a guy I know at the Academy of Sciences who studied this stuff. Before we know it, we got a list of a couple of people who had never talked about UFOs publicly before. I, I made a deal with the guy. We sent him back to Russia. We sent him up in an office. I said, here's what I want you to do. Find people who are in a position to know about UFOs, but have never tried to peddle this story anywhere. And he did. And for seven or so, seven, almost eight months, he searched out people like that. And then I went over to Russia to, to meet him. And um, we had to pay a little money here and there. But I brought back several thousand pages of what was then classified information from Russia. Their Ministry of Defense conducted the largest UFO study in the history of the world. And it lasted for 10 years. And the order basically went out that every unit in the vast Soviet military empire had to report and fully investigate any anomalous aircraft, ball of light, weird thing in the sky, anything that we would classify as a UFO. So all these reports, thousands and thousands of reports over a 10-year period rolled in, and they all went to the desk of this Colonel, Boris Sokolov, that I met. And we got the documents from him. And some of these reports were incredibly dramatic. Sokolov admitted to me, your government studies them, we're studying them, and for the same reasons. We want to be able to do what the UFO craft do and beat you in stealth. He said, these craft do things that we can't do. If we could master them and figure out how they do it, we could match you in stealth capability. So it was a very practical reason for the study. Uh, and it went on for a long time. He told me that they had had 45 incidents in which the Russian military planes encountered UFOs. They, they had a standing order. You see a UFO flying over Moscow, go get it. And in three of those encounters, the planes were shot down. And two of the pilots died. Now, this, is not, this is not funny stuff. And he said after the two pilots died, uh, the order went out, it was changed, that if you see a UFO, leave it alone. And the second time I went back to Russia, I interviewed a guy named Igor Maltsev, who was their, basically their secretary of the Air Force. He's the guy that issued that order. And he said, I did it because these UFOs, whatever they are, may have incredible capacities for retaliation. Uh, I will tell you this, how I smuggled, I, I smuggled some of these documents back. What happens is in, uh, in Russia is their, their classified documents they stamp them on the top page, and then the rest of it are not stamp classified, at least the documents we got. So you remove that top page, just throw the rest of that stuff in your suitcase is what we did. 
was carrying these top pages that got tricky, um, but I, I got them out. Um, and if I hadn't, I'd be in a gulag somewhere still. <laughs> I just divert to that story only to tell you that governments, other governments around the world, like our government, have studied this stuff. Of course they would. There was an incident in Russia, similar to something that happened here, at which UFOs appeared over a, an ICBM base, a base where these nuclear-tipped missiles are aimed at the United States. And these things popped up over a four-hour period. Now, all the witnesses who made these reports are military officers, and I got all of them. And so they described different things that these UFOs did. They were, there were some that were huge that split apart into smaller craft and then fused back together. Some of them just sat there, some of them zipped around, they made incredible maneuvers, and then right after being there for about four hours, the launch control panels that controls these ICBMs aimed at the United States lit up. Something entered the codes that enabled these missiles and they were ready to go, and a countdown had begun, and the Russians couldn't stop it, and they were freaking. And then the UFOs over the base go, poof, gone. Control panel goes back to normal. Um, Russians are shaking their head and wiping their brow. They called my friend, the Ministry of Defense guy, Sokolov, to send a team in to study it. He took apart the, the equipment. It, they couldn't find anything wrong. They couldn't find anything wrong. It had never happened be before. It had never happened since. And they concluded that these UFOs were somehow sending a message. This may be your most powerful technology and weapons, but it doesn't really impress us all that much. We had a similar set of incidents here at five nuclear bases along the U.S.-Canadian border in the mid-1970s. It was kept secret for a long time, but after the FOIA was, became law, they forced these documents out. UFOs visited these bases, one right after another over a two-week period, uh, encountered our warplanes. We tried to chase them, couldn't do it. They entered some codes. They disabled some missiles. Scary stuff. So when you tell me that UFOs are not a matter of national security, you're full of crap. And, uh, and that is the official version of our government, and they are full of crap about this. Um, so anyway, I think there's more than enough proof to consider that the subject should be taken seriously. Back to the story of Area 51. Um, why don't we play this other tape here? I'll just give you a little introduction to Bob Lazar. The key for me was I'm never going to prove that Bob Lazar worked at Area 51. So I tried to settle on did he work at Los Alamos, which he claimed, where he worked there in classified projects. And so we played a little game with Los Alamos National Lab for a couple of years. And um, here's sort of how it goes. There are problems with Bob's story here and there, and, and I'll talk about a couple of them. But as I mentioned, for, for me, a uh, key was, uh, did, he, did he work at, at Los Alamos in sensitive positions? Because if he had been there, uh, then it's at least plausible he could get hired to work out, at, out uh, somewhere else in sensitive positions, and I think he was there. I mean, I interviewed people that worked with him, and I'll tell you this, I haven't talked about this very often, but. I went to Los Alamos. We trespassed into the national lab on a Sunday, and Bob took me in. Uh, we went to, he, he still had a, a, uh, a contract with the lab to produce radiation probes that were placed outside the laboratory. So he took me there on a Sunday. We flew to Los Alamos, and he met us at the gate, and we got in a car and drove in, and he took us through these buildings, the place where he never worked, like a rabbit going through a, an underground maze. I mean, we were going all through, people are waving at us, and uh, they showed us where he had worked, we talked to people he had worked with, and yet everybody's telling us he wasn't there. We went in and got video of this, one of the world's biggest particle accelerators at the Mason facility where he worked, and they still said he wasn't there. Now eventually, I got something out of Lo Lo Los Alamos lab in which they said, all right, we found the number for him, he was here, but he worked only for a subcontractor and they gave me the name of the subcontractor, which was a headhunting company that had recruited him there. So I began a, a process with them, and I first contacted him. Look, this guy Lazar says you recruited him, you got him a job there at uh, Los Alamos. Do you have any records? Yeah, we've got records. Well, can I get them? Sure, we'll send them to you. A couple of weeks go by, records don't arrive. I call back again. Ah, uh, yeah, well, can't really find those records. So I started a series of writing letters. I got a, a stack of letters this thick, Eventually, they just stopped dealing with me at all. They, they stopped responding, period. Something changed. 
You know, and that was enough to really pique my curiosity, especially after talking to people who said that they work with them there. Um, and I know it's a leap to, to, to make that to Area 51. I know it's a leap. But some things that Bob had said, on the, on the, you saw that newspaper headline. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> on the day that uh, that story appeared in the Los Alamos Monitor, Edward Teller uh, was at Los Alamos giving a lecture. And uh, he was sitting outside reading that newspaper article about Bob and his jet interest in jet cars, and Bob walked by and he struck up a conversation. This is the story that Bob tells. And that is how he later, when he was here in, in Las Vegas, looking for something else to do besides processing photos, which he was doing for a period, uh, that he uh, got, he says he got an interview at eg and g and that Edward Teller was the guy who arranged it. Years later, after my stories came out, Edward Teller was asked about it on camera, and he gets really weird about it. Yeah, maybe I knew him, and maybe I don't. What of it kind of a thing. And, um, you know, you'll never be able to prove it. Uh, people that I know and trust who say that they have checked the records that Lazar was never at Area 51, I'll take their word for it. I certainly have trouble with Bob's claimed uh, credentials at schools. He had claimed to have degrees from MIT and Caltech. Now, I've talked to people who saw him at Caltech, but there's no, no records there. I think it is entirely possible that he would exaggerate his educational background in order to get a great job. He wouldn't be the first person to do that. He wouldn't be the first person to, to lie about his background and education in order to get a good job. And uh, you have to wonder, well, wouldn't the people who hired him know that? And yeah, they, they would have to. They'd do a background check. They'd have to know that. But I think in, in some way that Bob could have been the perfect person for that, that position. If you wanted to, example, test some theory, run something up a flagpole, see how the public would react about a story about flying saucers, he might be the guy to do it. Uh, he's technically proficient. He's an amazing guy. You walk in a room, I don't care who's in the room, he's the smartest guy there. Whether he has degrees from MIT or Caltech or not, uh, he, he just knows amazing stuff and can do anything with electronics or computers. He's a really smart guy. Uh, and I got to know him pretty well. I got to know him through a guy named Gene Huff, who I hope uh, was going to invite him here tonight. Gene was uh, a real estate appraiser who uh, worked with Bob and who also knew John Lear. And um, that's how that coalesced. A lot of people think it was Lear, the Svengali, who sucked Bob in and, and got him to tell all these crazy stories and in order, to, I don't know what, in order to do what, but um, that's not the way it went down. Those guys were friends. Um, Bob was out there for a period of a couple of months uh, from late 1988 until about April 1989. He had some personal issues that were going on. His phones were being tapped uh, as part of the security background is the story that he told. And uh, the guys who were listening in on the phones and checking his background found out that his wife was having an affair, and they told him. And sort of things just kind of fell apart for Lazar after that. He didn't like the work he was doing out there. He said the security was ridiculous, that they hadn't made much progress, but he told some really interesting stories about seeing these flying saucers out there in the hangars. And I know a lot of people have trouble believing that, but there's some other things that Bob knew that you have to ask yourself, how did he know if he wasn't there? So we, got a, we had another guy, a former uh, po police officer who'd done polygraph exams. In fact, he did it for, he still does it for a major casino corporation, a corporation that, by the way, is represented here tonight. And uh, he was a very credible guy. He took his time. He went through the, all the material with Lazar, talked to him about flying saucers, uh, antimatter reactors, which is what the power source was, element 115, which was the fuel, all that stuff. Gave him the test four times, and he passed. And it's not, he barely passed, he passed unquestioned passed. Wasn't even close. That polygraph examiner, his name is Terry Tabernetti, he gave uh, the results to his friend, who's a, another examiner who looked at it, who said, yeah, no question about it. A third guy looked at the results and said he passed. A fourth guy said, well, you know, I'd like to see him uh, ask some more questions, but he thought he passed as well. He passed it. Not, no, no question about it. I guess it's possible to do it, uh, but Bob had never taken a polygraph before, before I asked him to do it, as far as I know. Still, even with all that, I'm not sure that I would have gone forward with the story, except the fact that after we aired that silhouette interview, people started calling me with more information, people who said that they had worked out there. 
And I won't give you all of them, but I'll tell you that there are more than two dozen of them who had claimed to have some kind of knowledge, little bits and pieces of the story out there. Um, six of those people who called me and offered to give me information were visited after they called and told to keep their mouths shut. This is the kind of thing that really ticks me off because somebody was listening to my phone. It wasn't theirs, it was mine. Uh, there's a lady who works uh, even now in the Clark County court system, in the, in the court system. She's been there a long time, but before she was there, she worked as a secretary for a defense contractor called Holmes and Narver, which has worked at the test site for a number of years, unclassified stuff. And she says she sat in on meetings at which the Roswell wreckage was discussed. She took, uh, took notes on a typewriter that after it was done, the meeting was done, they took the ribbon out of this thing and destroyed it. Uh, she says they talked about the Roswell stuff coming to Area 51. She told this to a cop who's a friend of mine. He set up a meeting. We talked about it on the phone. We're going to get together. The next day, she gets visited by these two guys who say, you know, you're still under, your security oath is still in effect. You can't talk about anything that happened back then. We know that you and your daughter travel back and forth between Los Angeles. There's a lot of desert out there. We'd hate for something to happen to either one of you. This lady was scared, scared to death. That's 20 years later, I tried to get her to talk about it. She still wouldn't. I had a guy who worked at Channel 8 as an electrical engineer who had been at Area 51 for a while, says he saw what looked like a flying saucer under a tarp and was going to tell me about it. He had moved to another city. I call him up. He's living in Seattle. And I call him up and said, hey, would you tell me that story? I'll black out your face. He says, sure, just as long as you don't give my identity. Next morning, there's two guys sitting in a car outside his house, military haircuts, sunglasses, look like men in black or something, talking into a radio, making themselves very obvious. They follow him to work. They're waiting when he comes out of work and follow him home. Of course, he calls me and says the interview is off. I'm not going to do it. I had a guy named Roy Byram who does tax returns. And he did tax returns for a lot of high-ranking guys at Nellis Air Force Base. And after the Lazar interview, he called me up. He said, hey, I got some information for you because these guys, I got to know them really well. And they told me some stories about these disks, these alien disks that are out there. Swear to God, he says, that they told me the story. I said, great, I'll come and interview you. Next day, very next day, two guys from, they said, the Secret Service show up. They said, we hear you've been making threats against the life of the president. And we're just telling you that's a prosecutable offense. You can go to prison for this. He wrote back to me and said, I think it's an attempt to, to stifle, stifle me from talking to you. He was still willing to go forward with it, but I didn't know if it was a good idea. Six people right in a row that happened to. That, that, that makes a big impression on me back in those days, and, and it would now, and it made me really angry. But a lot of other people came forward with information that I met with, uh, people who had varying degrees of experience out there at 51, but is some of whom's background I could, conv I could uh, confirm, some of them I could not. Uh, there was a guy, there was a story, a, a guy named Michael Hunt, who surfaced in 1980, who had said he had worked for the AEC at Groom Lake in the 60s, claimed he sailed, saw an alien disc in flight, had a lot of really detailed information, uh, the, who came forward and, and told his story. There was a Wackenhut security guard who had a queue clearance at the test site from 1984 to 88, said he was pulling a shift at the internal entrance to Area 51, and they were buzzed by this glowing object at, at night. Um, there was a a Las Vegas attorney who served in the military in the 70s says he witnessed a disc-shaped craft land outside of Area 51, seemed to be in some kind of mechanical difficulty. He was subjected to several days of tough questioning after uh, seeing this thing and told that he didn't in fact see it. There was a uh, golf pro from Nellis Air Force Base who, like the tax guy, had struck up conversations and friendships with these Nellis Air Force guys and went on these outer, outer road trips. He said they were out of town watching a TV special about Roswell, and these guys started telling him the story. Now, maybe they were pulling his leg, but they seemed very serious. He thought they were serious, and they told him that the wreckage, some of that stuff, had eventually made its way to Nevada. And not necessarily just to Area 51. The first stories I heard about it were that they had gone to a place called Indian Springs, which existed uh, as a base before Area 51 was opened in 1955. Um, and then there was a guy, I'll tell you about two more. One of them, if you heard about this, this book on Area 51 by a lady named Annie Jacobson, I don't know if you, it's a really bestseller, it popped up and, uh, and has uh, made a bunch of, uh, got a lot of attention, 
It's a really excellent history of the roadrunners and the base and the really great stuff that went on. And then it goes off the deep end at the end of this book. Um, it says that it, based on the testimony of one EG&G &G senior engineer that, yeah, there were saucers out there at Area 51. They came from Roswell, but they weren't alien. Uh, the Russians had built them. They had um, taken these Nazi scientists and some uh, spindly prisoners of war who'd been uh, subjected to experiments by Joseph Mengele. They built this flying saucer based on Nazi designs, put these prisoners of war in as the pilots, flew it over to across the ocean to Roswell and crashed it to scare the hell out of the American public that we were being invaded by aliens. Now, that sounds pretty much ridiculous, except that the person who told that story to Annie, um, and it's, it's been widely ridiculed and dismissed because of how ridiculous it is, it is ridiculous, except for the fact that the guy who told her that, I know who it is, because uh, 20 years ago, I basically stalked him. Um, there were members of his family who hinted to me that he knew something about Area 51. This is not a Bob Lazar, this is not a guy whose credentials uh, can be questioned. Um, he really was in the places where he said he worked. He really was in a position to know with uh, high clearances. I am not saying that the person identified as any source is my source. I'm just saying that they're the same person. I'm not confirming that the name that's been made public uh, in reference to her book is the right one, because th that would be wrong, because I made a promise, uh, for one thing. I made a promise that I wouldn't talk about it. Anyway, this guy's family tells me he knows something about it, so I start showing up at places where he is. And I just ingratiate myself. I'm stalking him, basically, until I got to know him. And he invited me home to see his scrapbooks from the Atomic Energy Program, nuclear bomb photos, and photos of the old days working for EG&G. &G. And I'm there one day, and he, he's looking at it, and he's showing me stuff, and he closes the book, and he goes, you're not here to ask me about that, are you? I said, no, not really. This is not what you're interested in at all. I said, no, not really. So I know what you're interested in. I said, yeah, that's right. And his, his wife walks in, and she goes, oh, don't tell him that stuff. Uh, but he did. Eventually, he did. Over the ne next two years, he and I had a series of meetings um, at different places, having coffee. And it was like pulling teeth to get him to, to, to come out with this stuff. But the story he told me is much different from the one that ended up in this book. No Nazis, no Joseph Stalin, no prisoners of war. It was straight up alien stuff. And, uh, and I would have to ask him questions to get this stuff out. I would ask him, well, gosh, weren't you scared this thing was gonna crash or something or it would get, the, it would get out? He said, well, we were more concerned about it getting out. It? And then he told me they had a live alien out there. Now, I know how ridiculous it sounds. We're sitting here and it sounds ridiculous. But uh, given who this guy was, where he had worked, I took it pretty seriously. Uh, eventually, after a period of two years of him telling me this stuff, and I wasn't allowed to take notes, I, I would write it all down as much as I could remember after we had these meetings, uh, but uh, he had promised me, he said uh, that he had been told to shut up, that he was no longer supposed to talk to me. Uh, what happened was there was a congressional investigator with high security clearances who was sent out here to check this stuff out. Some members of Congress, the Senate, had an interest in these topics. The stories had come out, flying saucers, aurora, secret programs that weren't on the book, get out there and find out what's going on. So this guy came and saw me. I told him the story about the other guy. He got clearances to talk to him and to talk to his boss. And once, once the, that word was out, he stopped talking to me altogether. But he did make a promise that he was gonna make a videotape that would be released to me after he's, his death. Uh, he's still alive. But I, he, the last time I saw him, he said he did make the tape. The final witness I'll tell you is this. <clears throat> that helped convince me that this was a legitimate topic. And I haven't said this before in public. And it's uh, Senator Howard Cannon, who was a senator from Nevada. Uh, before he was a U.S. senator here, he was a brigadier general. He was a decorated war hero, World War II. Uh, he flew everything. When Howard Cannon was defeated in his last race, he was such a good friend of the military had done so much to build Nellis, had such a good relationship with the guys in charge of Area 51, the guys from uh, Lockheed, that they allowed him to fly the SR-71, sort of a going away present. So he was dialed. His best friend in the United States Senate was Senator Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater, even though he's a Republican, they're good buddies, they worked together back then, that could happen 
back in those days. I know it seems alien now, but Democrats and Republicans talked to each other, had, had drinks together. Anyway, um, Barry Goldwater was his best friend, and uh, Cannon would st started telling stuff to me through his family members, who I knew pretty well. And I finally had a face-to-face -face meeting with him toward the end of his life, and did probably what was la the last interview he ever did. And we touched on some of this stuff, but I asked him about Barry Goldwater had tried, was this chairman of the Senate Intelligence, Intelligence Committee, and he'd heard these stories about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and, and uh, the Blue Room or pro, uh, the uh, Hangar 18. And so he called up his friend, General Curtis LeMay, said, I want to get in there, I want to see it. And LeMay told him basically, you know, not only is the answer no, but hell no, and don't you ever ask again. And Goldwater is like, whoa, you know, I'm a, I'm a decorated war hero myself, he says. I'm a, he was a general, I believe. Uh, he's the Senate Intelligence Committee chairman, has all the security clearances he needs. What do you mean, no? I mean, no, and don't ask again. So Goldwater late, later wrote letters about it. So I asked Howard Cannon about this stuff. And it was clear to me that he and Goldwater had talked about it, not only about Hangar 18, but about Area 51, flying saucers. Uh, he told me, basically, look, what would have been the point? Uh, he, only, he came close to saying, I think I could have got into Hangar 18, but he said, what would have been the point of either of us getting in there or going to Area 51 to see this stuff? We couldn't tell anybody about what we had seen, and if we did tell them what we know is out there, they'd think we're crazy. Howard Cannon is, is no Bob Lazar. I like Bob and everything, but you, you, there's no disputing his credentials, Howard Cannon's credentials. He was there in, in the positions of power. He did have friends in the highest places in the government and the military and intelligence circles. So when he intimates to me that the saucers were real, that they were somewhere in Wright-Patterson or somewhere out in the desert, I believed him. Um, 1992, <clears throat> things took a bad turn for me and Bob Lazar. Bob comes to me, I was out of Channel 8 working on some private projects. Bob comes to me and says, hey, by the way, I'm, uh, I'm involved in this little brothel operation. It's a legal brothel. It's operating uh, in, a, in a couple of apartment buildings. I got to know the lady run to, running it, and I, I'm trying to help her. I put in some security cameras and computer codes and stuff like that. I go, are you kidding me? And uh, he says, oh yeah, by the way, it's on the same street where you live. <laughs> and my professional life flashes before my eyes. I, I, don't know, I don't know what to do. I said, I don't believe you, show it to me. And he took me to it, and sure enough, there it is. I, I told him, look, you've, you've got to shut this down. People want you to crash and burn. You're, you're probably being followed. Come to find out he was being followed by uh, a team from another TV station. They hadn't got onto that yet, but it was only a matter of time. The hooker he was involved with had two vice cops who were boyfriends of hers. Um, it was a matter of time. I said, you gotta shut this down, get out of this. I'm gonna call the cops and tell them about it, and, and hopefully you get a pass. Well, that was a bad decision. It was a bad decision on my part, because we did tell, Bob did shut it down, did get out of it, we did tell the cops, but they didn't let it pass. They were afraid we were maybe testing them or something, so they came and arrested him. I mean, you know what? Not a whole lot of people get arrested for pandering in Nevada, and uh, Bob was facing multiple felony counts. Um, and, and this is kind of a key uh, insight, I think, into his character, is that parole and probation did this big background check on Bob. And if you were a con man, and they were mad at him, they recommended he should do hard time because he's lying to us about his background. If you were a con man telling a story that you made up about flying saucers and being recruited by the Navy and EG&G &G and all this stuff, that was the time to come clean. But he didn't. Uh, he stuck to his guns in that story. And he, and he told the same story to them as he told to me. Uh, in the course of the trial proceedings, uh, we got a letter from Congressman Bill Bray, who had tried to help me get records on Lazar. And he, his office said, you know what, frankly, we have never seen anything like it. We write to the FBI and say, do you know something about this guy? Who wants to know is basically the response. Not, they didn't tell him, we don't have any information on the guy. They said, you have no right to know about it. It's a congressman. So 
You know, you can say what you want about Bob and, and the weaknesses in his story or what school he went to or, or what he really did or didn't do, but in a lot of ways, he might have been the perfect guy for a program like this. If you wanted to run it up the flagpole and see how the public reacted and then pull the rug out from under it, he was a perfect guy. Scientifically proficient, very knowledgeable, but if you needed to discredit him, you, you could. I mean, he flew a, a pirate flag on his, on his, uh, on his house. He loved machine guns, he loved hookers, he liked jet cars. He was a really interesting guy uh, who had had troubles in his personal life, and if you wanted to discredit him, you could. And I think in that way, he might have been the most qualified person for that job, which is why I still believe it's possible that he could have really been there. You know, I don't know if there were uh, flying saucers from other planets at Area 51, I'm never gonna know. But I do know that there is more than a few people who say that they saw something that looks very much like it out there and who have bits and pieces of the same story that Bob has told me. Um, the, the pursuit of the UFO story, as I mentioned, has taken me all over the world, to, to Russia and China and South America and Europe, and, um, and, and has taught me a lot, of, a lot of things. But my views have certainly changed from those days when we started. Uh, there's a guy named no, Jacques, Jacques Vallée, Dr. Jacques Vallée. If you've seen the movie Close Encounters, Francois Truffaut plays the character based on Jacques Vallée, and he told me uh, some years ago, I'm going to be really disappointed if it turns out that the answer to the UFO mystery is merely aliens from other planets coming here, because I don't think that's what it is, and neither do I anymore. Uh, one of these days I'll come back here and talk to you about Skinwalker Ranch, uh, but I think, I, I think this, this is not just visitors from other planets coming here, that it is part of something much bigger, much more wondrous, uh, much more mysterious and a lot harder for us to get our heads around, uh, but we'd need another two days to probably go into that. Um, thanks. Thanks very much. The question is, have I met an abductee who had some credibility? Yeah, and uh, some of them right here in, in Las Vegas, a couple in rural Nevada. Uh, you put them through a hypnosis session, which is not always reliable, but they, they come out of it separately describing the same kind of beings, uh, the same kind of experiences. There is, in some of those cases, physical evidence. It's a guy named Bud Hopkins, who just died a couple of months ago, who wrote Missing Time and a couple of other classic books in the field. Uh, you know, th there are people who, uh, who claim to be abducted, who want attention, who have mental disorders. Maybe it's uh, uh, epilepsy or some other kind of physical uh, uh, problem. But there are other cases that can't be explained that way. And if you, you're looking for a blanket explanation, as some people would like to do to explain it all away, you've got to explain all of them. And there's some of those cases that have multiple witnesses, multiple independent witnesses who've seen it from different angles, and some physical evidence. I met a lady named Betty, um, Betty and Barney, Betty Hill, which is the first famous um, abduction case. Met her at a UFO conference one time. That's a pretty good case. And then I met a lady named Betty Andreessen as well. And that's a pretty good case. Um, I tend to think you need to be careful with those stories because there are people who confabulate things and make them up. Some of them are just not very easy to explain away, though. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. One is that in the 1960, the Brookings Institute was tasked with doing a study for our government that said what would happen if suddenly it was revealed extraterrestrials have been visiting us for all, all time. And they basically predicted that society would completely collapse. That unless there was a conditioning program to get us ready for this, that we would collapse. It would be like a cargo cult where uh, some primitive tribe we encounter in Borneo or in, or in the Amazon, we know how that ends up. It's the primitive tribe, the more primitive tribe that disintegrates. And we would definitely be the more primitive tribe in this, in this scenario. That was true then. Since that study in 1960, is there anybody who isn't prepared for aliens? I mean, they're everywhere. They're in everything. Every movie and TV show, every book, everywhere. I think we would be ready for the general concept. When I did this story back in 1989, I did a little survey of all these different religious faiths. All of them said the same thing. It's testament to the greater glory of God that there are people out there, other people coming here. I think they saw it as great, good, more souls to save, uh, more, more uh, alien ducats in the collection box or something. 
So I don't think we would I don't think we would disintegrate with the general idea that aliens are coming here to visit us because they've been coming a long time. They haven't blown us up yet. So what's the threat? However, what if the ultimate disclosure is not that simple? What if they are describing something else entirely? By the way, um, yeah, the aliens are here. They're not really from other planets. Uh, they are actually interdimensional beings. They live here among us all the time, separated by a thin psychic membrane of some sort. They can see everything you do. They, can, they know when you're in the shower. They know when you're cheating on your taxes. They can read your mind. They can interact with our, li our lives at any time, come and go as they please at will. You can't see them, you can't know it. How do you like that? Uh, you, you talk about people freaking out. That, that, would, that would have you freaking out. And I think society would disintegrate. Yeah. Well, I, I just, like I think, I don't think there was gonna come a day when disclosure happens, uh, but the effects would depend on what it is that they disclose. Um, well, Phoenix Lights case, I think, is a pretty good case. There's thousands and thousands of people who saw it. Uh, uh, there's videotape of it. It's nothing that our government uh, has in its arsenal that we know of. That was uh, 10 years ago or so. Um, they made a feeble attempt to explain it away as flares coming from parachutes. No, we had no military craft in the area. They w that wasn't us. We don't know what the heck it was. You guys are imagining it. Oh. Oh, that's right, we had some planes there and we were dropping flares and parachutes and that must be what you saw. It wasn't. It wasn't pl planes and parachutes. In fact, it started here. It was seen first over Henderson and then went to Phoenix. Um, as for the story in, in, down in you know, Needles, it's kind of complicated, uh, but some witnesses saw a giant glowing cylinder come flying out of the sky. It landed just off the Colorado River, nearly hit a guy in a, in a uh, in a houseboat, uh, within a couple of minutes, a whole armada of helicopters came, including a sky crane, out of the sky, picked this thing up, and flew it off toward Nevada. And uh, in the days that passed, and I've talked to witnesses in various places who saw this, this in different stages, in the days after that, these like men in black type guys started showing up in needles and uh, in that area, Bullhead City, and, and hassling people who had talked about it on the radio. And so we started going down there and found these people said, look, you can't believe we keep seeing these uh, phalanxes of strange vehicles and military looking guys and sunglasses zipping through here and back and forth, see them all the time. So we kept going down week after week after week to try to catch them. And sure enough, we did. We caught, caught up to them. Uh, this, we saw this group, we're heading back to town, all these cars, these strange vehicles, just as described, antenna and stuff sticking out. So we zip around and chase after them, and I had a little camera in the front. We get up close to them, guys with sunglasses, military cuts, I start shooting video, they're talking in the radio. Pretty soon they pull over, one pulls over, we pull over behind it, somebody pulls up behind us. Guy jumps out, uh, civilian clothes, he's moving a shirt like this, I can see he's packing a weapon underneath of it. Uh oh. This, is, this looks bad. Um, he comes over, you guys get off the side of the road, get out of our way, who are you? Who are you with? What are you doing? And we're in an unmarked car, we're not, we don't have any Channel 8 stuff. I, we work with Channel 8, who are you? He goes, no, who are you? Show me your ID. I said, I'd like to see your ID. And he flashes a badge real quick. I didn't get to see that, and then he does it again, and he, it, this, he says he's working with the uh, Nevada Test Site. I said, great, good, I got lots of friends out there. We do stuff all the time, maybe we can ask you what you're doing because we're working on the story about this crazy thing in needles. He says, no, I'm not gonna tell you what we're doing. Get off the side of the road, stop hassling us, or you're gonna be taken into custody. So we continue shooting video, they take off, and it turns out they work for an agency, another agency I'd never heard of before, the OST, the Office of Secure Transportation. I get back to Las Vegas or somebody, a friend of mine calling saying, that was a bad move, because these guys are, are badass. Their job is to transport nuclear weapons. And they are trained, somebody messes with them on the road to take them out. And in fact, we learned subsequently that their vehicles are capable, even if they were killed, their vehicles could kill you by themselves. So anyway, I got to, I got to know these guys that, nope, I'd never heard of you, let's do a story about it. Their national director came out, they were doing some training at the Nevada test site. We got up there, got to do an exclusive story, got to know them, they were amazing people that did an amazing job but they had nothing to do with the men in black who are messing around with the folks in needles.
Uh, it was just a coincidence that they were going through the area at the same time that stuff was going on. But it was a very cool story to do. Uh, I would just say in closing, this is a fun pursuit and it's a grand story. And even if I never get uh, the, any answers that you can really point to definitively, it's been a grand adventure and a worthwhile pursuit. And I think it's something that you should be, if you're interested in these topics and you have a curious nature, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, that it is, if it came to be true and could be proven, it would be the biggest event in human history. The con confirmation of some other kind of intelligence uh, being among us or visiting us would be the biggest thing ever and it would change everything. And that's why I think it is a noble pursuit that is worth your time. And I thank you all for coming.